and they're going to be talking about successful e-invoicing for global corporations. I'm really pleased today to say that we're going to be examining the Kuna Nagel story and our sponsors for today, our trade shift. So I extend to you a very warm welcome indeed. Um, many of you know my name is Susie West and I am your host for today. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I set up shared services link.com. We are a leading business community for finance shared services leaders. And uh, we are now well over four years old uh, with over 7,000 members. Um, if you would like to find out more about the information that we provide and um, how our conferences and our webinars can help you improve your performance within your financial services, do go online. There's a lot of information and content there to help you. So let's have a look at what the next hour promises for us. The agenda looks like the following. I'm going to touch very, very briefly indeed on how the session works. And then let's get into the detail. Let's have a look at why we're actually having this session today. I'm then going to be passing over to our two experts who are going to be drilling into the story about successfully rolling out electronic invoicing for global corporations. And as I mentioned, looking in particular at the Kuna Nagel story. And then I'm going to be taking your questions towards the end of the session. So this is a very straightforward platform. Um, those of you who have used it before will be familiar with the workings of it. But for those of you who haven't used it before, we do have technical support on the line. Should you have any questions, you've got a free text box in your GoToWebinar panel. Pop your question in that box, and we will have IT support uh, responding to you immediately. E-invoicing, I say this again and again, um, is front of mind for so many high volume organizations out there, and specifically for shared services organizations who are dealing with 50,000, 500,000, 5 million invoices annually. Um, so a lot of organizations are looking at how they can eliminate those invoices, eliminate the touch points, but there are challenges to overcome, and this session in particular is looking at how we can overcome those challenges. Um, you will have questions, bring them to the table, pop them through to me, and uh, do that as soon as you can when a question comes up. Just put it in the uh, free text box of your GoToWebinar panel, pop that through to me, and I will put in those questions to our speakers in the last 10 minutes of this session uh, to make sure you get the most out of this investment of your time. So what's the intention of this session? Um, as I've mentioned already, um, e-invoicing is front of mind for a lot of shared services organizations. And one of the shared services organizations out there, of course, is, is being run by, um, by Kuna Nagel. Kuna Nagel is a, a global organization that has a history of very rapid growth. And they are um, servicing oh, and have presence within 100 countries. Um, so in particular, um, a company like Kuna Nagel looks at electronic invoicing with a slightly different perspective than an organization which maybe con has a concentration of um, invoices coming from three or four countries. So there is an added complexity with global com companies that have um, a reach that goes over 30, 40, 100, um, 100 countries. Organizations like Kuna Nagel, they have to make sure that the invoicing solution that they go for caters for um, languages and also tax requirements in multiple jurisdictions. So this is a key requirement that can actually end up influencing um, a decision as to which, which e-invoicing partner to, to, um, to work with. Also, I think that what will become transparent throughout the next 60 minutes is that a lot of organizations are, they are wanting to move to e-invoicing, but they're also wanting to look at other activities outside the invoice uh, that affect the supplier and how can they work with technology providers and partners uh, to automate those kinds of transactions and those kinds of activities to really add on the value of engaging in e-invoicing um, with, with, with an organization. So with all those, um, those intentions in mind, just before I hand over to our first presenter for today, I'd just like to do a bit of a, um, a quick poll question, if I may, coming up on your screen in the next couple of seconds. And this is really just to understand the landscape of organizations that we've got represented on this call today. So um, I ask all of you to, uh, to respond, please. How many invoices do you process today? So how many invoices 
coming into your accounts payable department, so these are AP invoices sent by your suppliers, do you process today? And this is on an annual basis. So is it less than 100,000 a year? 100,000 to 250,000 a year? 250 to 750,000 a year? Uh, three quarters of a million to 1.5 million invoices a year or over 1.5 million. Only 60% of you have voted. Uh, we always like to get these responses nice and high, please. Um, it's always very key for us um, and you to do benchmarking. So if you haven't responded, please do so. And I'll be closing the poll in three, two, one. Okay, we were just shy of 70% there. So let's have a look at the results coming up on your screen now. So quite interesting here, actually. Normally, we, with a question like this, we have a bell curve in the results, but we certainly don't have a bell curve here. Um, we have a, a 26, or over a quarter of you, having between 250,000 and 750,000 invoices, and over 30% of you coming from organizations that process 1.5 million invoices a year. So we've got a very high representation of high volume organizations on the line. Um, I now like to introduce um, Christian Hood, who's the Chief Commercial Officer at um, TradeShift. And just before I do so, I think as well, I think um, many of you who, who, who um, are familiar with TradeShift, you'll also know um, that they have um, been gleaning a lot of attention recently with a quite significant round of funding of 17 uh, million US dollars that has recently come in. Um, to support their growth plan. So it's a very exciting time for TradeShift. And on that note, over to you, please, Christian. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, and thanks a lot, everybody, for, for dialing in. Um, I would like to, to spend the first uh, bit of time to uh, discuss what is TradeShift, um, because as you may know, we are a relatively young organization. We've been around for, the, for a couple of years now. Uh, but I think that so far we have managed to make a significant footprint in the market. Not only have we closed some very interesting customers, but I guess that our approach to electronic invoicing and, 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 and building a, a global business platform has really made a significant impact in the market. Uh, but before we, we really go into the details, um, I would like to, to start out by, by really uh, going through a few slides to look at what is what is it that, that we are trying to tackle with electronic invoicing? And, it, and it's kind of crazy because if today we're in a situation where we send around 300 million pieces of the paper, those could be invoices, orders, credit notes, uh, delivery notes, these, these kind of things. And the, and the thing is that most of them start their life in a, a IT system. Uh, so we type them into an IT system, then we print them and we ship them, and we, at the end of the day, type, type them into a new IT system so we can get all of these reports. Um, and if we look at the cost for uh, doing this, uh, uh, that's actually uh, pretty pretty massive. Um, so we did a, um, a study during the spring, uh, an infographic, where we looked at what is the cost. This is something that has been done by a lot of analysts. And I think it's, it's pretty safe to say that as a minimum, uh, an invoice to an organization that is received on paper would cost the organization no less than 10 euro to a process. Uh, but in many organizations, this number is significantly higher. Um, and all the invoices that are received, a lot of them uh, contain mistakes. I mean, there are a lot of errors. And in certain industry, now it says here, on average, uh, 10 to 40 percent. But in certain industries, uh, transportation, this number can be significantly higher. So we're really talking about a lot of time that is being wasted on uh, dispute management. Um, and on top of that, then even when you receive invoices that are, that are perfectly clear, you still receive uh, a lot of phone calls, a lot of incoming uh, requests, emails, phone calls, where they just ask, have you seen my email, uh, my invoice, is it okay? You know, all those typical questions. So it's not only about the hard transaction of transmitting the invoice, it's also a question of supporting those soft processes. And that's the whole question. Uh, question uh, about being out of out of sync, so I mean everybody is is looking to move over to real time. So whenever the invoice is created from the from the vendor, then the buyer can actually see the invoice, uh, and we see there is a significant uh, delay. I mean that can be several days. Typically, it takes more than two weeks 
before you can do the uh, reporting on the incoming invoices because there is uh, a very long process to handle it. And of course, there's the entire uh, uh, carbon footprint. Um, so, so, so the good question is really to ask, I mean, we, we know that uh, this has been a problem for a long, long time, and uh, how have we really tried to, to solve that problem? And you know, why hasn't it been solved now? Um, it has been solved partially for some organizations, but most of organizations still haven't really uh, been at a situation where they have uh, solved this uh, to a satisfactory level. Um, so if we look at the history of the exchange of the, of the business documents, then it's basically all started out in the 50s, where we automated the, uh, the invoice printing. Soon after, uh, or I would say not soon after, but, but approximately 30 years after, uh, electronic data interchange came up, and it was basically a, a way to exchange business documents between big organizations. It was very, very costly, uh, so it was, it was typically uh, onboarding ratios that were that were really low, and it was uh, between very, very big organizations. Uh, then came scanning OCR, and um, that solved part of it. Uh, it. It optimized part of it. Uh, but if you talk to most organizations, they still manually have to touch a very, very big part of the invoices that have been scanned. Uh, then we have the whole stuff about the trade portals, which was not successful. Uh, and then something interesting happened in around year 2000, because the first pure electronic invoicing networks popped up. Uh, and, and those are the ones that are today well known by uh, most organizations. They are the uh, incumbent players. You know, they are the existing big, big players. So they they launched with the promise to be able to connect basically any organization. Uh, and, and I think that we'll just spend one minute diving into to the, to the details uh, just in uh, two, or two or three minutes from now. Um, but, but another thing that was pretty interesting happened in, uh, in the Danish market because around 2005, there were three people working for the Danish government. And they were given the task by the Danish government to move into electronic invoicing. So they were on the buyer side just as you are now. Uh, and they were asked the question of, you know, what technology should be used to move into 100% electronic invoicing? So the government would not accept that they reach 30, 40, 50%. It was, it was basically everything that the government would receive should be electronic. So they looked at EDI, they looked at scanning, they looked at the e-invoicing network that were out there, and they realized that with the business model uh, that, was, that was widely spread, they would never be able to, to achieve those onboarding rates. So they decided to build their own infrastructure. Uh, and one of the first things that they did was to, was to make it uh, completely different in the way that the business model was, uh, was, was thought of. So, they, so on, from the supplier side, it was completely free. And what happened very quickly was that within the first 10 months, 25% of all Danish companies uh, went online. So that was more than 70,000 organizations uh, that, that uh, went on to the, to the network. So if, if you look across uh, any global, uh, any, any global uh, e-invoicing network, those numbers were, were, were very, very high. Um, and I would say uh, today the uh, government receives approximately 98% of all uh, documents electronically. Um, then the founders of the trade shift, after they had worked for the government, they were invited to the uh, commission in uh, Europe to do a, a project called PEPL. So they were, they were the, the co-founders uh, of the technological platform of the PayPal. So they had done the first generation in Denmark, the second generation was in, was in Europe. And then after they had done that uh, infrastructure, so both of them massive infrastructures, then they decided to build traces. And they wanted to do a lot of the same things that they had done in terms of the uh, technology base. So it should be open, it should be cloud, and it should be free. Uh, so when they launched TradeShift, they did it in the Nordics, um, and they launched in six markets, uh, and the platform spread like wildfire. Um, so within six months, the platform was used in more than 60 countries, and today we have 60,000 users on the platform 18 months later in 190 countries. So if we look at the established players in this market, one of the big problems that we see is that they typically only connect to suppliers that have very high volume. Uh, and they typically do that because there is a big cost for the, for the vendor. So a lot of the cost uh, for the network or for the transmission of the electronic invoice is put on the supplier, even though that it is the buyer that receives most of the benefit. Um, 
the other problem with the existing networks is that a lot of the soft processes that we uh, discussed in terms of the incoming phone calls, the ability to do disputes, all those things, you know, handing back the acceptance, so whenever you accept an invoice from the buyer side, making that visible, those are all processes uh, that, that those networks don't cover. And I think another key thing is that they get 70% or even more of the revenues from the supplier fees. And it makes sense that when you charge the supplier's fees to uh, participate in the network, few organizations will be, will be willing to move into electronic invoicing. And I think a good question to always ask yourself as an organization is, well, how much cost are we willing to put down on these suppliers, and how much of that cost do we, at the end of the day, expect to get back? Because typically, suppliers are not just going to accept that they have high fees to submit electronic invoices. They're going to try to get that money back somehow. So um, what is it then that we did in order to do something differently? We basically looked at the market and we said we need to do something completely different in order to, uh, to do something uh, that is attractive for the, for the market. So first of all, we decided that uh, we would work very, very structured uh, with the suppliers to remove barriers. Um, but at the same time, it should be a question of putting uh, incentives so it was more attractive. So the first thing that we did was to look at the business model. So we wanted to, to change this. So electronic invoicing, we think that's uh, ultimately going to be a lot like email. So uh, you don't pay to send emails, and I don't think that, that you should pay to submit electronic invoices. So we have removed the supplier fees 100%. So any organization globally can send invoices completely free of charge using trade ship. Uh, what, what does that mean for you as a buyer? It means that more suppliers will get online. The business case that, that, that you ultimately looking at is going to be much better, and the relationship to the vendors is also going to get much better. And at the end of the day, it's a question of reducing cost and increasing value for both parties. Um, so if we look at uh, into more detail, um, how do we do that, and you know how is price shift different? Then I would say one of the things uh, that we are trying to achieve is to build a, a global business network. So this is not just for us about electronic invoicing, but we use the electronic invoice as a way to build uh, the world's largest business network. The invoice is in itself a very uh, interesting document because it's by nature viral. If you receive an invoice, ultimately you have to invoice somebody else, otherwise you go out of business. And if you can tie an invitation mechanism uh, to that process, uh, then we are much like uh, the other social networks that spread uh, on a viral basis. So what we tend to do is to compare ourselves with uh, you know, networks like LinkedIn, where you, where you can connect. You can do all your invoicing on the trade ship platform. This is not only for organizations that are on the platform. You can, you can create your profile and you can invoice any organization, whether they're on or, or outside the, the network. Uh, and you can invite businesses. So just as you have a profile on, on LinkedIn and you would invite your, uh, your uh, colleagues, the same goes with Tradeship. You would create your Tradeship profile, and you can invite all your uh, business partners, whether they are suppliers or their customers. And once you have done that, then you can send uh, documents electronically, and you can collaborate real time with with them. So all these soft processes are also handled in the in the platform. And on top of that, it it is a question of uh, allowing companies to extend their business processes. So yes, invoicing that is that is a key process, but it's not the only, this is not the only one. So we would want to allow companies to do more than just invoicing on the platform. Um, so if we try to look at uh, how the network uh, really works uh, and you know how it spreads, then uh, if, if 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 you decide to go with a trade shift as an organization, you would then invite your entire vendor base. Um, so that basically means that we'll do an uh, onboarding uh, for your vendors, uh, and they would then uh, go online. They would then start submitting invoices uh, to you. Um, they can then use trade shifts to invoice other of their clients too. So instead of them reactively waiting for other of their big customers to start requesting them to go to and use other networks, then they can start proactively saying, well, guess what? I can send you electronic invoices. Do you, wanna, uh, do, you, do you want to receive electronic invoices through the trade shift platform? And on top of that, since they have seen that it has been easy to connect to the platform, uh, they may also want to uh, invite their vendors too 
to participate in the network. So this is how the network grows uh, on, a, on a viral basis. Um, and if we see what is the status of the network then, uh, then during, this, uh, during the first 18 months of the, of the trade shift history, we have managed to onboard uh, approximately 60,000 organizations. Uh, and those are spread in more than 190 countries. So of course we have not done active selling in uh, all those countries, um, but uh, a lot of a lot of uh, companies are inviting other uh, companies in uh, other countries, and and uh, this is basically how the network grows. Um, so today we are by far the fastest moving or the fastest growing network. We do part of the onboarding, but the fact is that the viral component really kicks in here because without us knowing, those organizations are then uh, you know, uh, inviting other business partners to be part of the network too. Uh, and also we are working with uh, a lot of very, very big organizations. So NHS is a, a big client uh, of ours, so National Health Service in the UK. We are working with the French government uh, to standardize on the trade sheet. We are working with uh, a lot of uh, uh, transportation companies, DSV, and of course Kuna and Nagel. Uh, and um, we look forward to hearing that story. Um, so with that, I will just pass over to Susie for the next poll question. Thank you very much indeed. Christian, so coming up on your screen, if you could respond, please. We got to about 70% on the last poll questions, uh, last poll questions. So coming up on your screen now, what percentage of your purchase invoices, your incoming invoices, are received in a pure electronic format today? So we're not referring to kind of email PDF. Um, we're talking about a data stream that's coming in. So is it below 10%, uh, 10 to 25%, 26 to 50%, 51 to 75%, or over 75%? Please, if you, uh, we've had about 61% of you respond. If you haven't already do, done so, please do tick a box. It just helps um, everybody on the webinar gauge where they are so that they can benchmark if they're ahead of the curve or a little bit behind the curve. Um, so we're at 66%. So closing the poll, ladies and gentlemen, in three, two, one. Let's have a look at the results coming up on your screen now. So um, you can see there, not too surprising, 45% below 10%, but I absolutely vouch that a year ago that figure would have been much, much higher indeed. 33% have really kind of dipped their toe in, into the project and um, have their project potentially underway with 10 to 25% of invoices converted to electronic. And if we go right down the, the list, we've got um, a 5% five, 5 of you with over 75% of invoices coming in electronically. So relatively positive results there. And back to you, Christian. Thank you, Susie. OK. so. Um so looking at the business cloud, what is it that we offer? What kind of uh, services do we offer to, to big organizations? Um, so, if you, if, so here we have basically mapped uh, the uh, different products that we have. So on the upper left corner, if we start with the invoicing, um, then this is the ability to receive electronic invoices. Uh, and it's basically also the ability for the supplier uh, to, to submit uh, invoices. If you are a buyer, uh, and you're receiving invoices, then with the Trade platform, you have the ability to send out invoices too. And the uh, and, and, and sending out invoices with the Trade platform, even if you are a buyer, is also completely free. Um, what If we then go clockwise, then branch management, that is the ability, uh, that is a tool that, that buyers use to map their organization on the network. So you may have a lot of legal entities where you receive invoices, so this tool uh, will help you map those legal entities on the TradeShift platform. So we make sure that the suppliers, when they invoice you, uh, can uh, send the correct invoice to the correct legal entity. Uh, the business firewall is, um, is a very uh, a strong rule engine that allows you to do uh, validation rules on the creation of the invoice. So what does that mean? It basically means that when the supplier creates the invoice, then you can make sure that the invoice validates according to your business rules. So that could, for instance, be a certain purchase order number. It could be a personal reference. It could be a customer. It could be something else. So you can set up these rules for specific suppliers or by uh, uh, specific uh, 
supplier groups, specific countries. So you can basically tailor this tool uh, to do the kind of uh, business rules or the validation rules that make sense for you. So you can do this very, very detailed uh, for suppliers that are uh, at the uh, advanced uh, vendors, but you can also do it uh, much more soft uh, for suppliers uh, that you receive very, very few invoices from. Um, so the advantage of the tool is basically that all the validation happens when the invoice is created. So when the supplier creates the invoice, he cannot send the invoice unless it validates according to your business rules. So that means that the data quality that you get in is going to be significantly better. Of course, we do all the archiving according to the uh, rules in the uh, specific country. Uh, you have your own archive, so no invoices on the platform is, is ever shared. So there are two copies of the invoice the sender of the invoice and the uh, receiver of the invoice. We have the ability to, to do purchase orders. So you create the purchase order in your backend and we can send it out electronically. You can then uh, flip that into an invoice. Um, and you have full visibility down to the field level what the supplier can change in the invoice. If you, if you don't allow them to do any changes, then you can also match uh, that invoice when you, when you get it back in. Uh, the advantage of being in a network is that we can uh, update master data. So all the suppliers in the, main, in, in the network would maintain their own master data. That could be generic master data like phone, email, addresses, uh, bank details, and so on. Or it could be more detailed uh, master data such as price lists and uh, catalogs, these, these kind of uh, things. But being in a, net, in a network really means that everybody would maintain their own master data and whenever they do changes, then all the organizations they're connected to can then subscribe to those changes and can push them back into your uh, finance system. Uh, supplier in, uh, engagement is the ability to do uh, support and to do onboarding. Uh, and you also have the possibility to build your own apps on the platform. Uh, and then the last thing which is really key is regarding instant payments. So these are our financial uh, applications and this is really how we differ in the market where we say that it's possible for suppliers to get paid as soon as you have accepted the invoice. So this is uh, supply chain finance, uh, dynamic discount, these, these kind of um, uh, processes that we also support. Thereby, we suddenly make e-invoicing more attractive uh, than sending paper-based invoices because if you can get your invoices paid as soon as your buyer has accepted them and don't have to wait uh, the 60 days, that is suddenly a very uh, attractive offering. Um, so if we just very, very quickly look at the platform, um, we do, uh, we have done a lot of things. As I said, this is a third generation platform. It was done for the Danish government, for the uh, commission in the Brussels, uh, and now for, for trade shifts. So it's really all about uh, security. We encrypt every uh, transaction that, that, that we do on the platform. It is done like uh, Google style, Salesforce style. We are a very open network, so we work with Pebble, the uh, European uh, project. We use the uh, universal business language and we had the uh, OASIS group which is really promoting that the service providers uh, work more together so we make sure that we can uh, bring the four corner model forward. And in terms of the uh, compliance, this is an area that is that is really key. So we're working with PricewaterhouseCoopers to make sure that we are VAT compliant in uh, all the markets where we have enterprise customers. So today the, those are 30 countries and we are rolling out uh, to, to more markets as our enterprise uh, customers move out. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to the last poll question uh, for Susie. Thank you very much indeed. Christian, coming up on your screen. Um, so this is a question about uh, what you're expecting to achieve from moving to electronic invoicing. Please select um, two two of the following. Are you looking to primarily reduce costs, increase accounts payable efficiencies, um, and improve and in, in, improve your transparency of your transactions, um, reduce supplier calls and inquiries coming into your help desk, um, or is one of the top two really to reduce your carbon footprint? Um, we're going to do this poll relatively quickly, um, so if you haven't already ticked your boxes, your two boxes, please do so. 53% of you have voted, so the remainder of you, please do Pick the boxes appropriate to your situation, what's driving you, and what you're expecting to look, um, expecting to get from e-invoicing. And I'll be closing the poll in three, 
two, one. Okay, 64% of you, 65% of you voted. So let's uh, share the results coming up on your screen now. So um, two clear winners there, 75% um, for reducing cost and just shy of 80% for increasing accounts payable efficiencies. And the loser uh, was to uh, about re wanting to reduce the carbon footprint in, um, in the, for those of you that were ticking the top two. Okay, thank you very much. And back to you, Christian. Thank you, Susie. So uh, the last part that I just want to cover is the way we do onboarding. Um, so you can basically say it doesn't really matter how good your software is if your uh, suppliers won't use it. Uh, so it's really a question of sending the uh, right messages uh, and I think you know we have proven, or the team behind TradeShip has really proven in these large-scale uh, projects that that you know this is something that we do really, really well. Um, it's 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 a question of also helping you from a from a process point of view to optimize your internal processes because at the end of the day it is a change management uh, project, whether on the supplier or the buyer side. Uh, but the way that we do onboarding is that we try to build tools. Uh, that are much better. Uh, we are a, a software company and what we do really well is that we have very manual processes in this industry and we need to, to, to do things in a much more clever way. Uh, so we build the right tools that can support you in the onboarding process. And what that basically gives you is onboarding with trade shifts that are much, much higher than the industry standard. Uh, I think we can basically more or less guarantee that we can do that at least five times faster. Uh, and with better results than, than, than anybody in this industry. Um, one of the key things is the way that we integrate uh, to the uh, supplier side. So we make sure that from the supplier side there are always free alternatives uh, to integrate. So we are never in a situation where you would have to ask your suppliers to pay for the integration. That they can always do that free of charge. Uh, there are paid options, but it's important for us uh, that there is a free alternative always, whether that is the web interface uh, our uh, our uh, integration uh, interface, or whether they connect to an uh, SFTP server. Uh, if you want to do it paid, we have uh, the connectors you can basically buy, or we can handle this uh, to a partner, and they can do that at a at a flat fee for for 800 euros. Um, so with that, um, I'm basically done with my presentation, but we are open. Uh, to 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 answer any any questions you may have after the presentation, uh, but for now I would just like to to hand over uh, to uh, Jeff Hannon, who is the national AP manager at Puna and Nagel. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Christian. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. I, I realize how important everyone's time is, and I really appreciate you taking the time out to to look at this here. Uh, just a little background, quick background on myself. I've been with the, in uh, the company for 25 years here now with Kuhn and Nagel, uh, primarily in, in, the, in the accounting and finance sections. But a lot of time is spent, I spent over the years on implementing new accounting packages and software and change management. TradeShift is, is uh, to me, one of the more interesting programs I've seen in, in quite a while here. Just some background on our business. Uh, we're a worldwide international forwarder and logistics provider. So in, in simple terms, what, is, what does that really mean? Well, if you have a small package or some letters, you're going to use the mail or UPS to send these locally. But if you've got an oil rig or some expensive medical equipment, you need to move from one part of the country to another or different countries, you should be calling Cune and Nagel. Maybe you're a supplier and you need someone to control all your warehousing and distribution to make sure your product is on the shelves when needed. Again, you should be calling Kuhn and Nagel. Now, as the uh, webinar here is, is really about trade shift and not about Kuhn and Nagel, I'll just touch on, on some of the key points that you see on your screen now. Uh, for sea freight, we're number one in the world, sea freight forwarder. Air freight, number three. In the contract logistics, we're number three. And in the lead logistics, we're number one. So clearly, we're a uh, dominant force in, in the forwarding market. Now, let me just throw out a number for everyone on here right now, 8 million. This is how many invoices we're receiving worldwide in the Kuhn and Nagel organization. 
Now we take 8 million invoices. Now you'll know many invoices are more than one page and a lot of times there's backup with invoices. So how big is that number really? 20 million, 30 million? Clearly a lot of paper coming through our organization. In 2010, we had over 163,000 suppliers worldwide. It's enough to fill up a telephone book. In the USA alone in 2010, we processed over 1.2 million invoices. Clearly, I think everyone on this call can see there is a real need for automation on our side. One of the issues we had was should we switch to a global e-invoicing platform? And what were some of the reasons we decided to switch? Well, we, we looked at the, the trade ship platform and, and we said this was actually a, a perfect fit into our new version of our financial system. We're currently installed and worldwide. Also, to improve the, our, the entire P2P process, we really needed to eliminate the large volume of paper invoices still being received worldwide. You can imagine if we got rid of these invoices, we have no manpower to open, review, and sort all these different invoices coming in every day. We don't have to worry about storing them. We also looked because we needed to centralize our invoices. Uh, I have 80 branches, over 80 branches in the U.S. alone receiving invoices all different ways, through email, through fax, some hand-delivered. So we really needed to, to, to get a better uh, grasp on how our invoices were coming in. We needed to reduce our filing and, 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 our, and our retrieval costs down the road. Many of you, I'm sure, at one point or another had to call back some sort of physical document from a warehouse that was stored two years ago. Uh, with this, we needed to uh, try to get these costs down, and one of the best ways was to consider e-invoicing. We also have, uh, I think one of the biggest issues is today is the vendors calling the different branches for statuses on their invoices. You know as well as I know that we need to get paid as quick as possible. So a lot of time is spent on, on chasing these invoices and, and calling the different branches over and over. With the e-invoicing, and with the trade shift platform uh, itself, a lot of this goes away. Now, how did we decide to go with trade shift? We ran, internationally, we ran an RFP process that basically included all the major players in the market, trade shift as well as the other partners. One of the biggest things we realized was in moving to an e-invoice platform, we didn't want to push the cost of the e-invoicing to the sender. Personally, here in, in the United States, we are currently uh, using some e-invoicing. And from the vendors that we're using, we're actually paying to send these invoices. With trade shift, there's no cost. We also needed to have a vehicle or a process in place that was simple enough that people wouldn't be afraid to use it. They would sit down and say, oh, this is really easy. Let's do it. In fact, when we, we did some of the tests here, everyone was uh, really surprised how remarkably easy it was. And, and we were sending invoices back and forth in, in a test environment in literally in minutes. We needed someone also that can cover our global organization. We just we don't need someone that can help us in 10 countries. We need someone that can help us in 100 countries. We have 900 offices worldwide. We have 60,000 employees. We needed someone that can join all this together. This is why TradeShip was determined to be the right partner. Now, very early in the stage, I'll be honest with you, but from what I've seen so far, uh, things are, are progressing quite nicely and in pretty much exactly to plan. Uh, the overall benefits, which we'll see uh, once we're on this platform, uh, 
I'll touch, a, I'll touch base on a few of them. First of all, the centralization of in, invoices. Once all the vendors are on and they start sending the invoices, I have a clear channel where all my invoices are coming in. I don't have them going into different branches through different methods uh, where some, in, some people may not know exactly where the invoice goes, so they'll set it aside and eventually that invoice gets lost. And we never really know our true liability because we have, simply don't have all the invoices on hand. We needed uh, clearly everyone to join. So with this, we think we're going to get better adoption rates. Trade shift is free for the suppliers to use. So it won't matter a cost to them. That they would join much easier than if they were to be re required to pay. Uh, trade shift is very easy to use, as I mentioned before, very, as, as Facebook or, or LinkedIn. And trade shift for us is, is guarantees the highest level of, of safety and security. So we think we're, we're pretty much ahead of the game in, in using trade shift here. Now, some of the benefits to our suppliers. Again, this was not all about Kuhn and Nagel. This was also about making sure we didn't force costs onto our suppliers. For our suppliers, free invoicing. Their invoices then are paid promptly. If they're sending invoices through the mail or to various different branches and they, they mail the, to the wrong branch and it has to go uh, into company through, through different branches, uh, there's going to be a slowdown in the invoice uh, payment for sure. We also have, uh, with the TradeShift platform, uh, requirements to the invoicing themselves. So today, I'm sure you're getting some invoices from some companies which are fantastic, very detailed. Others, I'm sure you're getting which are not the best, and you, you can't even tell what the charges are for. In order to send through trade shift, they're going to have to meet certain requirements. And once those requirements are met, then the invoice will be accepted. Obviously, if they're sending an, an, a correct invoice from the beginning, there'll be no delay. So there'll be no kickback to them and then they'll re receive a, a payment a lot quicker. Now, two, from the suppliers and, and from our end, once they're on the trade ship platform, as Christian mentioned, not only can they send invoices to Kuhn and Nagel, they can send invoices to whoever they want. And it's, a, it's an open platform. If you're using one of the other providers to bill someone and you want to bill someone else, uh, you may not be able to use that same platform. So this was, again, thought from our end to help the suppliers. Uh, in the, the, one of the biggest things, too, is, is reduced postal cost. How much are you sending? How many invoices are you sending at 44 cents here in the United States to just for the postage alone? Then you have the cost of the envelopes, the manpower to take it and, and process it. So clearly, a, a lot can be saved to our suppliers by moving to this platform. Now, if I, before we, we moved into the trade ship platform, we had our supplier database invoicing us in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, they were sending invoices to over 80 different USA branches. They were sending invoices to the head office. We already had some sending EDI, but most of these EDIs had to go through an external system, not our direct ERP system. I'm proud I've set up a, a very good uh, service center uh, where the invoices are then channeled through that service center and, and then processed into our ERP system. So there's a lot of different methods before trade shift, where the invoices are coming, how they're coming in all the different uh, steps and, and, and landings they have to take before they actually reach our ERP system. As we move to the trade ship model, this, this all goes away. Basically, the supplier database simply sends their invoice through trade shift, <coughs> excuse me, and the trade shift simply sends these electronic invoices into our ERP system. 
no mail, no going to different branches. I save a lot of manpower on processing, receiving. I save in the service center. And for the most part, I have a direct booking of the invoice into my system. So at any given point in time, I can truly know my liability for this. In going over a quick chart of, of, of how we uh, fared in, in, in the first three months with the TradeShift platform. Again, very early, but numbers, is, numbers here are very promising. Uh, these numbers include five nations that we started with the test system, with the initial status here. <clears throat> the, the Netherlands and Austria came on very late in the process, so they actually brought these numbers down a little bit. But for the U.S., U.K., and, and Singapore, some of these numbers are, are, are quite interesting. If we go from right to left, we have 10% of the uh, original database that we, we tried to get on board are actually sending electronic invoices right now. I've got another 12% of these vendors in the process of sending, and I've got another 30 activating and also uh, about to start integrating and sending. So basically, I have over 50% of our sample on, on the program already with very, very little input from my side. I have 48% where we have no action. And basically, all, all there was was an email that went out and really no follow-up from our side. The minute we start following up from our side, I'm sure we'll have that 48% online without any given problem. So in, in, in a quick summary here, the trade shift platform or works for Kuhn and Nagel. It's a sound business case. I think it's the best solution for KN as, as well as our suppliers. We can generate savings very quickly on our side and on the supplier side. And I think what Christian mentioned too, there's also a lot of additional opportunities presented by the trade shift product and, and, and vision that they have. So from my end, uh, I appreciate your time very much. I hope you found what I said uh, quite interesting. And I will go back and, and let Christian take over. Christian? Thanks a lot, Jeff. Thanks for this. This was very inspiring. So just before we open this up for, for questions, just a few takeaways uh, from, from the trade shift side. So I, I, I hope that it's been clear, at least this was my goal, uh, to, to show you here that, that there is another approach to electronic invoicing. There's another approach to building a, a global business network. So, so what we're basically bringing to the, to the table is, is a completely new business model. And I hope that you have seen from the, from the numbers that Jeff has, uh, has brought forward that, that you know, this is paying off. We are seeing onboarding rates that are significantly higher than anybody else in the market. Um, I think what is also uh, worth noticing is that um, you know trade shifts can work with any size of uh, organization on the supplier side too. So whether those are suppliers that are that are multinational that send you know tens of thousands of, uh, of the invoices, I mean uh, Jeff has some of those uh, in in his numbers, or it's the mom and pop shop that only sends you know like a handful. They can all use the trade shift network. Uh, and what we do from trade shift side on the buyer side is that we can you can use us as the only electronic invoicing tool, or you can use us to complement the systems that you're already working with right now. Uh, we know that a lot of organizations have already done attempts within electronic invoicing, and that's absolutely fine. So if you have something and it works, don't fix it, but use trade shift to go after anything else. So all these suppliers that you haven't been able to onboard, use trade shift to, um, to get them on board. Uh, and, and then think about that trade shift is much more than electronic invoicing. We are trying to do at all times more things than just electronic invoicing. Electronic invoicing was the first step for us because this is how we built the network, uh, but we are offering uh, to support more processes. And I think that uh, we didn't spend a lot of time uh, on our product called instant payment, but I think the ability for the suppliers to get paid early 
this is also one of the things that we do that are going to drive uh, adoption of uh, really high. Um, so finally, what we have done is to give a bit of advice for, for all the companies that are, that are in a buying process. So uh, just a few things that we think you should uh, consider before figuring out whether you want to go with purchase or, or with somebody else. Always make sure that it is not only about volume, it's also about connecting uh, real time to every supplier that you have. Because by doing that, you position yourself uh, in such a way that you can do more advanced things. For instance, update master data, do financial applications, these things where you can build significant business cases on top of electronic invoice. But without the electronic invoice, you cannot do these things. So it's not about volume, it's also about the number of suppliers to get them online. Um, and then involve the users in the selection process. Those are not internal users, those are the users of the platform. So involve your suppliers when you decide whether to go for traces or for somebody else. Ask them what do they think of the business model. Ask them what do they think of the system. Will they use these systems? So when you run your RFP process, bring these suppliers in. Pick two big, two medium, and two small ones, and get them in and, and look at the system too. If, if, if they don't like the system, uh, then you don't have your internal business case. And then, as I said, it's a question of creating the additional incentives for the suppliers to make sure that they are on board. The return on investment is the only uh, it's, it's, it's only a result of your ability to onboard. So if you pick the wrong tool and your suppliers don't onboard, then you don't have a business case. Uh, and then the final thing, always evaluate the total cost. Those are both supplier fees and buyer fees. It, it's not only your cost, because at the end of the day, a lot of the cost on your suppliers are going to end up on your table anyway. So if you want inspiration to how to write the perfect uh, RFP, you can log on to tradeships.com slash blog. Uh, we did a blog the other day uh, regarding input into 10 areas you should definitely uh, consider putting in your uh, RFP. So with that, I'm basically done, and thank you very much, and I'll hand back to Susie, who will open up for questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Christian. So um, just before we move into questions, and we have uh, just shy of 10 minutes for questions, and we do have a lot of questions that have come through. Um, Trade Shift are sponsoring our two upcoming conferences, the AP Tech Summit, which is looking at technologies that will help you eliminate manual touch points across your accounts payable function. Um, that's taking place on the 6th, 7th, and 8th of December. Uh, we're down to about our last 15 places for that. Um, however, Trade Shift, who is sponsoring, they have purchased an additional ticket, and it's up for grabs for a raffle um, for specifically for this webinar. Similarly, Trade Shift is sponsoring uh, the European Summit for Leaders in Financial Services in London in March. So coming up on your screen now, I'm going to leave it open for about one minute. Um, if you would like to um, please um, take to participate in the raffle, please do let us know. So coming up on your screen now, if you can tick what you would like to qualify for. Now let's get into some questions. Um, so I'm just going to ask questions relatively rapidly and look for relatively swift responses, please, so we can go through the majority of them. Um, Christian, for you, I've got a number of questions coming through about um, the um, availability of trade shift, so both kind of um, where, you're, where you're available as a technology, where you're legally compliant. Sure. How do the geographies of um, Asia Pacific, Latin America, and also, interestingly, Switzerland is coming up. Could you just talk to us about your presence um, in those geographies? Yeah, so uh, Latin America, if we start by that, then uh, we have a lot of users on the, on the platform. We have not any active enterprise customers in uh, that region yet. Uh, we are opening, uh, uh, opening up our uh, main office in, in San Francisco in uh, two months. Uh, so that will be a natural step for us to also uh, focus uh, more uh, on middle and, uh, and uh, Latin South uh, America too. Uh, when we talk about Asia, uh, then Asia is, is, is actually one of our largest or fastest growing markets. So India uh, is, the, is the largest or the fastest growing market uh, for, for the trade platform. Uh, again, a lot of the uh, enterprise sales that we have done so far has been out of Europe, uh, but organizations are onboarding uh, on those markets, in those markets. So for instance, uh, uh, Jeff also said uh, they are now starting up in, in Singapore, and, and part of their rollout is, is to also include more uh, markets in uh, Asia. But the main, uh, the main market for trade shift is still uh, within Europe when we talk about enterprise sales. 
Um, but in terms of the users on the platform, those are, those are spread globally. Um, when we talk about compliance, uh, then the 30 markets that we are uh, compliant in, some of them are uh, Latin uh, American markets, but most of them are within Europe. Uh, but we also are compliant within uh, countries in uh, Asia. The ones that are interested uh, can reach out for me and I can provide you with a full list um, of those markets. And of course, Switzerland is uh, a market that we cover. Uh, Green and Nagel is a Swiss company. So, so, so. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So, um, about your um, compatibility from a technology standpoint, a question here about um, your interfaces with Oracle and SAP and the ease of that. Yeah. So, uh, we run standard connectors to those two systems uh, and to other systems too, but those are the two main ones. Uh, so we have a connector to SAP that is certified by SAP in, uh, in Waldorf. Um, so that is a standard connector that you implement. The implementation from a technical point of view is uh, done in, uh, I would say, hours, uh, one day. Uh, then it's a question of uh, setting that up depending on how many changes you have done to your SAP system. Uh, that is typically a, a, a task that would take uh, two or three days, but it's still uh, very, very simple, and if you have internal SAP guys, uh, this, is, this is generic stuff, this is stuff that they do all the time. Uh, Oracle, we have a uh, connector too, that is, uh, we, have, we are in the process of, uh, of getting that certified by, by Oracle. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So, um, uh, we've got an inquiry that's come through here um, from a gentleman that's been asking a couple of questions actually. Um, as far as the onboarding is concerned, so Kuhn and Nagel, you, Jeff, you were talking about the fact that uh, you were onboarding um, primarily via email and that there was um, um, no actual kind of follow-up action um, as such that was required from the kind of the Kuhn and Nagel um, buying organization as such. However, um, if, if, there, if, there were, if there was follow-up action, um, what would that be and why do you think that would be particularly effective? So this is a question for Jeff, please. Hello, Jeff. Sorry. Christian. Uh, okay. <laughs> from, from my end, I, I was really quite pleased at how simple it was uh, to start this whole process. Basically, I, I, we gave trade ships some, some contacts and some emails, and that was pretty much it. Now, for the remaining, what we'll do from our end is we'll actually make a call to these vendors and tell them it's in their best interest in, in both of our interests. We'll explain the platform. We'll tell them how easy it is, and, and we'll move them onto the uh, e-invoicing platform. Honestly, I think down the road will eventually require such invoicing, uh, just a move that, that we have to do in, in order to get some of this paper outside uh, and done with. Okay, fine. Um, and let's stay, just stay with um, supplier onboarding a little bit, if we can. Um, so a couple of questions that's come through. This one is primarily for you, please, um, Christian. Obviously, um, there's a lot of attention on the trade shift solution because it is free to suppliers. That, that's one, one yeah. kind of key facet of your, your proposition. And your opinion, though, um, is, is cost the only obstacle to suppliers coming on board? Um, and getting that obstacle out of the way, what kind of difference do you think it, it genuinely makes um, for a supplier? Um, so if they were kind of... Uh, as an obstacle, what is, is cost to a supplier coming on board? I, uh, that's, that's a very good question. I think, I think cost is, 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 a, is a big one. I mean, uh, when, when you talk about suppliers that, have, that need to connect to networks where they are charged a lot of money, uh, they, they, they absolutely are not happy. And the problem is with that model is that, is that they get locked in. So there's absolutely no incentive for that provider to decrease fees. On the contrary, you have seen any organization that provide electronic invoicing and charge these suppliers over the past years, they have been increasing uh, their supplier fees. And the reason is because there's a vendor login. I would say it is definitely not the only one. It has a lot to do with our ability to do more things uh, to allow the suppliers to interoperate with, uh, with other providers to submit their invoices to all the customers that they have. So, so be able to offer more processes 
uh, I think I think this is a key thing. So so definitely cost is is is, is, a, is a big one, but it is definitely not the only one. But we but what we try to do is to constantly look at ways to incentivize these uh, suppliers because at the end of the day, uh, if we if we focus on the buyer side, uh, we don't we 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 basically miss out on a lot of the suppliers that we could have onboarded. So if we create incentives for them on board, then, then on the buyer side, they'll be happy anyway because they get their business case uh, when, when, they, when they get the electronic invoices. Okay, good. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have actually come to the end of our 60 minutes. However, um, because there have been so many questions, I would like to extend um, this session and move to what we call a lock-in. Um, um, I would just like to say goodbye to those people that do have a hard stop um, on the hour and invite you back next week where we, I am interviewing a, an industry leader on the future of electronic invoicing. So that's a very exciting session. Please do join me for that. We're also doing live benchmarking throughout that session. So please do bring some KPIs with you. And that's on the 15th of November. Also, just like to highlight to those who are leaving, dropping off the, the webinar now, uh, that uh, from the 12th, 13th, and 14th we, of December, we have a, a webinar series taking place on those days. Um, specifically focusing on SAP. So for those of you who couldn't make our SAP conference in October, please join us for that. Let's move on and we will be extending the session by no more than five minutes for those of you who would like to stay on the call. Um, now I'd like to put a question again. We've got a lot of technical questions coming through, Christian. So technically, from a supplier's perspective, what do they need to, to do to be able to send electronic invoices to their customer via by a trade shift. Yeah, so the way that the onboarding works is that we send uh, an activation email, and the way that the process uh, works before the activation emails is that we prepare them for the change. So we send out uh, a number of emails where we say, this is what's going to happen, this is trade shift, this is the advantages that you get from trade shift, this is how you can leverage trade shift to do more than just electronic invoice. When they then get the activation email, uh, and, and, and before we send out the activation email, a lot of the stuff we have done is to segment them. So we, so we pretty much know what kind of system do they, do they use. Uh, do they have a finance system or, or would they uh, today be using uh, Excel or Word for the invoicing because then they can use our web portal. Uh, but we send that activation email uh, and depending on the size of the, of the uh, supplier, then a few different things can happen. One is that they just activate that. Uh, and once they, they activate and they log on to the system, they create their profile on the network and they are already integrated or they are connected uh, to, the, to the customer and then they can start sending. Um, if they need to do some kind of an integration, uh, there are a couple of different things that can happen. Either they are a, a supplier, could be mid-sized organization, and then we have, uh, then we have showed them or before the activation emails, there have been webinars uh, where, and they have had time where they can call us in and they can ask technical questions of how can they integrate, do they want to go with a uh, connector that we have for their finance system, do they want to upload uh, via an uh, FTP server, what are the different options. Um, or if it's a key supplier to the organization, then uh, Kuhn and Nagel, for instance, they could choose a, a certain time or certain time slot where one of our technical people would be ready to, to walk through the uh, integration process. Uh, so, so this is a, a, a specific time slot that is uh, agreed with the uh, supplier, it is sponsored by the customer, uh, and then we have one of our technical guys to, to help them through to make sure that, that they're basically handheld through the, through the onboarding process. But again, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a question of making the the, the integration process smooth and, and, and easy, both from a technical point of view, but also from a change management point of view. Okay, thank you very much for that response there, Christian. Um, um, and now, this is a slightly unusual question. I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, and uh, do you provide like an open list of suppliers connected to the network that, that a buyer can look at and examine how many of their, their, their own suppliers are already connected? Uh, no, we, we don't do that, but what we do, or what we have done in, in, in certain cases, uh, is that we have done a supplier match. So the, oh, sorry, yeah. so, so the customer has, has uploaded their list or given us their uh, Excel file with, uh, with, with all the vendors, 
uh, and then we have basically looked uh, and, 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 and done a uh, tender mapping. I think this is this is very very um, this is something that that is very very used, and I think this is this is something that we will do, and and that we can easily do it. Uh, typically, you should expect that the match rate of the traced platform is is lower than any other network, uh, but that doesn't really scare us because we know that that the way that we can onboard is so much better than other organizations. Uh, so so that is really not what you should focus on. Whether you have a uh, hundred uh, suppliers more match one of the other networks in the market than on uh that will basically be uh, be equaled out because or very fast because the our onboarding is uh, just so much faster. Uh, and and on top of that very few organizations today do electronic invoicing. So okay. this is absolutely something that we can do. Uh, but sure. but but I mean yeah. on more of an individual basis and one to one. Yeah. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Um, and sorry, I do feel like a lot of questions are coming your way, Christian. Um, now, uh, uh, two more questions before we're pretty much over our five minutes. Um, the question that's come through, where in the business cloud are the kind of the tax legal requirements being dealt with? Yeah, so, so those are, those are uh, processes that we, that we don't sell as a, as, as a product. I mean, the, the, the the thing that you can do, or the way that I can position it to make it uh, easily understood, is on the app side. The way that you activate apps, one of the apps you can activate as a organization is the ability, is the ability to do a uh, digital signature. So let's say Kuna and Nagel uh, want to do digital signatures in Switzerland and in and in Austria, they can activate an app. And the reason why we build this as apps is we don't want to. Uh, contaminate the user interface, so we don't want to to make it um, to, to to make it cumbersome for organizations that are not really interested in this functionality. So if you want that, then you activate it as an app, uh, and then you pay from the time that you activate it in those markets that is relevant for. And let's say that you, for instance, had it in Germany, but then the uh, legislation changed, uh, so you don't want to do digital signatures anymore. Then you deactivate that app. Uh, and then you have only paid for the time that that app has been activated. Um, did that answer Thank your you. question, Nora? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. And actually, it takes me to my final question, if I may. Um, now, obviously, there's been a lot of talk about apps, and there's been a, a focus on the fact that um, we're not just talking about pure e-invoicing here. We're talking about supplementary um, activities that concern and, and benefit the, the supplier as well. Could you um, just maybe give a little bit more of an example of, um, and I know we, we talked about it a few slides back, but maybe just hone in on a couple of uh, useful apps for the suppliers. Yes. So, um, if if I may, just ask uh, start with with the buyer side because the uh, digital signature that, that is that is one of them on the buyer side. Another one could be a buyer deciding to build their own app because our app framework is completely open. So any organization can build their own apps. So, for instance, when you sign up a new supplier on the network, it could be that the master data we ask for in the platform is not enough for you. That you want more detailed information. So then you can easily build an, an uh, application. You can activate that. And as soon as a supplier uh, creates a profile on the network, they would be asked to install that app. Uh, and then they need to provide more master data. So that means that the registration process of the suppliers can be done in a much better way. And we can, and we can help you get all that master data that you would uh, require anyway. Uh, that's, on the, that's, that's on the buyer side. Uh, on the supplier side, useful apps could be the ability to do uh, time registration, uh, inventory management, all those kind of uh, things. But what we're basically aiming for, and uh, I would like to remind you, this is still early days for us, but, but we want to be the delivery channel for other providers or for other IT companies to develop applications and sell them through the network, just like you do with your iPhone. So on my iPhone, I have activated the apps that make sense for me, just like a carpenter would then activate the apps that make sense for his business. So by doing his invoicing on the trade platform and then activating the apps that make sense for him, uh, then the platform is then much more than just invoicing. Then it's, then it's his business platform. And, and, and this is where we're heading. Uh, this, this is the vision of the company. Thank you very much indeed, Christian. And that's a very nice note for us to finish on. So Jeff Hannon. 
from uh, Kuna Nagel, thank you very much indeed, and Christian Hoard from Trade Shift, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's brought um, our session to a close uh, and the end of our lock-in. I'm very pleased to say that um, over 60% of the, the webinar attendees stayed on board for the lock-in, so thank you. Um, do join us next week, as I mentioned, for a one-to-one -one interview with me and an industry leader in 